You know, I went to Starbucks the other day to get some coffee. What? Oh, you just like Starbucks? Yeah. <laughs> Starbucks is good. Today's happy hour? Fantastic. Great news for all those that are locked in this room for the next two hours. Um, however, the barista actually had a, a mask on at the time. And so when I went to go get my order, I was like, oh, are you like, are you worried about, you know, the coronavirus? And she said, no, it's really just a coffee filter. Get it? It takes so long. <laughs> That's pretty good. Huh? That was that was a joke. <laughs> let's, just, let's just cancel class. No, I'm just kidding. No. All right. Uh, so anyway, we were talking about acute kidney injury. We we're talking about ways, uh, some ways to prevent it. We talked about fluids being really the, one of the best ways to help make sure that the patients are tanked up from an intravascular sort of standpoint. Um, we talked about some antioxidants and things like that. Once they actually have it, again, not a whole lot you can do. There are things people have tried, especially uh, if the patients are maybe oliguric and you're trying to increase some of that urine outflow, especially to get rid of some of those things like potassium and, and whatnot. You're going to find a lot of these are not going to be super effective, but it's still good to kind of cover them because you may see them being used for these purposes here. So the first one we'll mention is one called mannitol. Uh, and this is something you may not see necessarily used a lot from a diuretic perspective, but you may see used in some other cases, which I'll, I'll make mention of in just a few moments here. Basically, this is an osmotic diuretic, so it has a high osmolarity to it and is able to basically draw extra fluid into the renal tubules such that you should increase urine outflow. <clears throat> Typically not used as sort of like a long-term sort of diuretic, um, really for short-term use. The other thing that's kind of useful uh, with its hyperosmotic properties is the fact that it draws fluids from areas of, say, low solute concentration into it, right? Because water wants to go to where the high solute concentration is to balance that out. So what other maybe areas could you draw fluid out of? the brain, right? So you can use mannitol in cases where patients have uh, maybe head trauma or maybe they have hydrocephalus or something where they have increased intracranial pressure. You can draw fluid off of that. So you'll see that used pretty frequently in like the trauma uh, centers. You'll see it used in the surgical ICUs, things like that to help pull that extra fluid off. And then once it's out of the brain, you just pee it off essentially. Um, what's interesting though is that hyperosmotic nature of it also can actually induce acute kidney injury in and of itself. So that's the reason why you may not see it used for this particular purpose here. The other really important thing to note with uh, mannitol is you have to filter it. Does anyone know why you have to filter it? So what's interesting, yeah, it actually crystallizes out. So this is um, a vial of mannitol that's actually left at room temperature. Um, as you might imagine, that's a very obvious large size crystal that's in the vial itself, but um, you can have micro crystals that can cause emboli potentially if you're injecting that into your patient. So we filter it to make sure we get rid of all those large particles. Um, that has a lot to do with the temperature and typically in hospitals, do you try to keep things warmer or colder? colder. Why colder? And we don't bugs to be growing if we don't have, uh, have to. So typically we'll have um, a mannitol warmer in a lot of places. We'll see those being held there. Um, I call it the easy bake oven because it usually is like a little thing, like a little door you open up and you pull out the mannitol and it's hopefully still in solution at that time. Um, interesting story, and this may be apocryphal, but it was an old school kind of pharmacist that told me this. He said one time they had a, a trauma patient coming in. Uh, they were concerned with herniation. Uh, the brain stem, so they wanted to get the mannitol going. He goes to find the mannitol, it's all crystallized. So this is like years ago. Um, and so he said, okay, what can I do to heat this stuff back up? He says, I know, I'll go get a microwave. I'll use the microwave in the cafeteria. So it takes a couple of vials of mannitol, runs over to the microwave. And what do you think happens to a glass enclosed uh, sort of vial like this when you heat up the contents? It perhaps explodes and all that glass comes out of shrapnel essentially. So he says there's a big chunk of it sticking out of his, uh, his badge, which makes me sound like he's hyperbolizing the story quite a little bit. but. Um, Point being is that you got to warm this stuff up to get it to go into solution and microwaves are probably not the best way to do that. So <laughs> anywho, um, we will oftentimes see loop diuretics being used. We know these to be the most potent sort of diuretics that we have. Um, again, pretty well tolerated, cheap. Be wary if they have a sulfa allergy, you know, things like furosemide may potentially cross react. Um, what's a safe one to use if they had a true blue sulfa allergy? Just remember at the acid. Yeah, that one's typically pretty safe there. Um, but Bumax, Torsamide, things like that are going to be better, uh, uh, more commonly used in a lot of cases that are, maybe you've seen ethocrinic acid once or twice. Um, 
You'll find though that you may have patients that can actually develop diuretic resistance here, especially if you're trying to use these um, in a more chronic sort of sense here. And so typically some things we can do, if maybe they're an oral, you know, loop diuretics, you can switch them over to parenteral, that can certainly help. Um, there's not really a ceiling dose that you're gonna see with your, a lot of your loop diuretics. You can keep pumping the dose, but eventually you're gonna get have kind of a plateau effect. You're not really gonna get much more bang for your buck there. Um, sometimes we'll use continuous loop diuretic infusions. Um, sometimes what we'll actually do is add on other agents that can help out with this. Because again, if you imagine if you're blocking sodium reabsorption in which portion of the renal tubule with loop diuretics? The ascending loop of Henle, yes, very good. Um, you can end up seeing increased water and salt reabsorption in the, proc uh, the distal convoluted tubule to kind of make up for that. And so in which case, by using a thiazide that works in that distal convoluted tubule, you get better synergy there. And that can help to res uh, kind of resume normal or kind of help to increase that urine output a little bit better for those patients there. Um, but keep in mind, you know, depending on kind of what level of function they had prior to the acute kidney injury, um, if the nephrons just aren't working that well because they've been degraded over time, that this may not be, you know, the most helpful thing that can uh, that can work for that. Um, so just be aware that, you know, that can be an issue. This loop resistance, there are some ways we can try to get around it. So, um, be wary with your thiazide diuretics because a lot of them end up losing function as you get lower and lower creatinine clearances. The one exception is metolazone. That one always will continue working even at creatinine clearances less than 30 mLs a minute. Uh, remember that's when I said that a nephrologist told me one time that it can make a rock urinate essentially. Um, so always remember that one because rocks, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, their their kidneys are notoriously <laughs> poorly functioning and so if it can make that pee then it's got to make anything pee right. So typically, if you had a patient who really had you know, significant decreases in their GFR, such that they may be down like 15, 20 mLs a minute, you could use something like a loop that will retain efficacy there, plus something like metolazone and get that additional benefit. So um, other things you can try, maybe some that work more in the collecting duct, like a potassium sparing diuretic, spironolactone, um, you can try those, but again, you get diminishing uh, effects as you get into those less potent sort of diuretics. So in terms of electrolyte management, this is going to be a big thing to watch out. So you have to watch your fluid levels, you have to watch their sodium, you have to watch the potassium, magnesium, and things like that. Um, typically for these patients, due to a lot of fluid retention, they can also have a lot of sodium retention as well. Um, ways we can help out with that, including things like helping to limit sodium intake if we can. If they're in-house, we have pretty good control over their diet for the most part. Is that always true? Why not? People can sneak them food, you know. Um, Married one guy. Did I ever tell you about the guy uh, who was admitted for drinking isopropyl alcohol, for rubbing alcohol? So he, this is the guy who uh, came, this is a bit of a tangent, but kind of shows you the way that patients will kind of get around the system a little bit. Um, we had a patient who uh, was admitted for drinking isopropyl alcohol. He found altered uh, by the police. So they brought him into the ER, and so he ended up admitting him until he could clear off um, the rubbing alcohol from the system. So we're doing serial monitoring um, for, why, why would someone drink isopropyl alcohol anyway? If they can't afford regular alcohol, I don't know if you've actually gone to the store before, but you can buy rubbing alcohol extremely cheap. And actually, it's twice as intoxicating as rather regular ethanol. I would not suggest drinking it, though. You get hemorrhagic gastritis. It's not great. But when you're in a bind, people resort to alternative measures. So this guy did that. Ended up being admitted. And so we were monitoring him kind of serially at his, his uh, serum osmolarity to watch that kind of come down um, as he was clearing off the isopropyl alcohol. Actually, also turns into acetones. So we're watching that as well. And so we we're watching it go down, down, down by day. And then all of a sudden, it spiked back up. And we're just like, where is that coming from? So we did an ethanol level on him, and it was actually positive. And we're like, well, where is he getting the ethanol from? This guy didn't really have any family members coming to see him. But where do you think he's getting it from? The hand sanitizer on the unit. So he was actually using the foam sanitizer. He would uh, put it on top of his jello, or he would just squeeze it into his mouth. And where there's a will, there's a way. And so again, you'll find patients will, will go out of their ways to, to you know circumvent your orders that you have for them. So even though you have the best, uh, best intentions, they, they may go around that. So. Anyway, point being is that um, try to limit that sodium intake. But if you have some of these patients, especially someone with like a real true blue SIADH, like they have that really strong thirst response, that really strong salt intake response. And so they, they will you know, try to bribe their family members and nurses to go down to the cafeteria, get them some French fries or something, but to try to limit it as best you can. Um, helping out with this as well, things like renal replacement therapies, if indicated, can help to pull off some of those extra electrolytes like your potassium and magnesium and whatnot.
you'll find um, that like phosphorus is not going to be so great here. Magnesium is a little bit pulled off, um, so you may have to watch that. And, and phosphorus can really be a big issue, especially if you have things like rhabdomyolysis occurring here, or if you say you had a crush injury from a trauma or tumor lysis syndrome, all those things can eventually cause uh, high phosphate levels to be developed. And then you have to watch the calcium as well, because if you make the calcium phosphate, does anyone know what happens? They form calcium phosphate, and it's actually um, it's not soluble in, in water typically, so it'll crystallize out, and that can cause emboli throughout the body. Not great, so you have to make sure you're watching that product there. We'll talk more about that uh, factor when we get to the chronic kidney disease stuff a little bit later on. Um, also interesting, though, that patients on renal replacement therapy can actually develop hypocalcemia, and the reason for that is is that when we're taking the blood out of the patient and putting all this plastic tubing, it being exposed to sort of this non-organic sort of material can actually stimulate the clotting cascade to occur. And if you recall back to that clotting cascade um, many months ago when we talked about that, you'll remember that calcium was a really important uh, cofactor for helping to stimulate the activation of a lot of those clotting factors. So what we do for them to prevent the circuit from clotting off is we'll actually give a uh, anticoagulant that's citrate based. So basically the citrate will bind up to the calcium, form calcium citrate, and then it doesn't interact with the clotting factors any longer. However, you bind up all that calcium in the unit, or in the actual circuit, put it back into the patient, they develop hypocalcemia. So in some cases, you just have to watch that and maybe actually give them some additional calcium to re, kind of resupplement that. Does that make sense how that, me that mechanism there? You know, citrate anticoagulant binds to the calcium and then they develop the hypocalcemia from that. So those are the things we can do to help manage those acute kidney injuries when they occur, but ideally we'd like to prevent them from happening in the first place. Any questions on that? If not, let's talk about chronic kidney disease. Let's say patients either have, say, long-standing deterioration of kidney function, or maybe one of these cases of acute kidney injury has led to chronic kidney disease for these patients here. Typically, we'll kind of categorize it based off of the decrease in their GFR that they have there. So for instance, you can go all the way from, say, stage one down to like stage five, which is our end-stage renal disease, where they have a creatinine clearance less than, say, 15 mLs a minute, for instance. Um, and again, why do we care about this from a pharmacologic perspective? It's going to affect a lot of their medications. And not only that, they're going to have a lot of secondary effects as a result of poor kidney function, many of which are going to require extra medications for us to actually help manage that. So this is important um, and something we're always screening for in our patients, especially elderly patients. So. Um, some of the complications, just to give you an example of different things that can occur as a result of chronic kidney disease, we can see that patients are more likely to bleed. They have to develop this kind of bleeding uh, propensity. You can see platelet function is going to be inhibited, especially in uremia. Um, you can find that because patients aren't clearing insulin as effectively, because you know, insulin is partially cleared by the kidneys. They can develop hypoglycemia. Um, they can have all kinds of GI issues as a result of this. And we'll also see that things like you no know, encephalopathy and, and peripheral neuropathies can develop as a result of this kind of chronic high uric, uh, uh, uric acid levels. So some of the things we can uh, see that actually lead to chronic kidney disease, and these are kind of the more, more common ones you're gonna see, include things like type two diabetes very frequently. Um, in addition to that, you'll see things like hypertension, they usually go hand in hand in a lot of cases, uh, and then even things like autoimmune conditions like glomerulonephritis that occur here can lead to this chronic kidney disease. And again, we see these risk factors as well, a lot of it being metabolic in nature, things like you know obesity, uh, hypertension, but certainly smoking is another big uh, factor as well. Um, smoking, nicotine itself, is it typically more vasodilatory, vasoconstrictive, what do you think? Typically vasoconstrictive, right? You typically see that can exacerbate hypertension in patients, and so you can see how that would uh, be a contributing factor there. So um, we'll see that when the damage occurs, it can happen from a lot of different pathways. It could be due to things like proteinuria. It could be due to loss of actual nephron mass as they start to degrade. Um, a lot of it can also be related to this glomerular uh, hypertension that occurs. As you sort of put extra pressure on the glomerulus, um, it can cause sort of a damage over time such that you can't filter quite as well as you used to. And so you kind of see how a lot of this stuff tends to be sort of uh, cyclic in nature and how it tends to exacerbate itself in terms of all the effects here. Now, I'm not going to have you memorize anything off the slide specifically, but it's just to kind of show the point um, that, you know, you develop sort of this reduced filtration area that occurs here as damage done to the glomeruli happen. And so you're going to see a number of different effects occur. So if you're not filtering as much through the kidneys, how do the kidneys respond to that? The RAS system is going to get upregulated, right? Because they say we're not filtering as much, we're not uh, getting as much fluid and salt through. Um, we need to go ahead and try to increase that. So you'll see that the RAS system is going to be upregulated in those cases. And so that's going to increase blood pressure, it's going to increase ADH release, it's going to increase all these different things. Um, what do you think that does to the glomerulus 
the hypertension in the glomerulus over time it's going to worsen it right so that's why you see that what uh, class of drugs are typically nephroprotective ACE inhibitors, right? So it kind of makes a lot of good sense there because everything kind of goes back to that RAS system as a result of this decreased filtration area and, and, and ability to do that. So we're going to see that all these different things will kind of feed into one another that eventually lead back to, again, worsened filtration area. And so this is why you get that sick cycle until they basically have no kidney function left. So other issues that can occur, we'll kind of talk about individual features that happen here in patients with chronic kidney disease and how we can manage those. Um, first of which we'll talk about is going to be the anemia of chronic kidney disease. This is a common thing you'll see in patients, especially those that are on dialysis, uh, intermittent dialysis. Typically when do patients go, if they're on dialysis, when do they go? Anyone know? Yeah, usually Monday, Wednesday, Friday. A lot of times you'll see them in the ER. They'll go for like Monday, Wednesday, Friday for four hour sessions. Um, you'll typically see them in the ER on Saturdays or Sundays because they forgot to go on Friday perhaps or they had something to do on the weekend and so they skip it and then guess what now they come in because they're hyperkalemic and uh, having all kinds of other issues so but anyway so what you're going to find is that a lot of the erythropoietin that we have actually comes from the kidneys themselves and so as kidney degradation occurs you end up losing that function you're going to be releasing less and less of that erythropoietin so you end up developing this kind of normal chromic normocytic anemia basically they don't have the stimulus to produce those new red blood cells but you also have iron deficiencies that can occur in these patients as well because you'll have things like decreased gi uptake um, also in these patients they're going to have a lot of blood testing being done right a lot of blood draws can eventually lead to anemias as well um, just the dialysis circuits in and of themselves, they can start to lose uh, some blood from that additionally. And so they typically will have higher iron demands than a typical patient that was a, a good kidney function was producing their own erythropoietin. We're going to see here that we'll have agents that we consider to be erythropoietic stimulating agents or ESAs. Those are going to kind of be the cornerstone of therapy here. But if you're not also supplementing them with appropriate amounts of iron, what's that EPO going to do? Nothing, right? You can't make hemoglobin without iron, so you're going to see it's going to be uh, not very effective. And so these are pretty expensive agents too, and these are not things you want to be wasting because the patient didn't have good iron intake. So other issues that are going to happen here include things like um, kind of bone and mineral related disorders that occur as a result of chronic kidney disease. And we'll see here um, that there's a lot of abnormalities because they can't process things like calcium and phosphorus appropriately through the kidneys in and of themselves, such that you're going to see issues with PTH. You're going to find um, that they're going to have high, eventually high levels of both calcium and phosphate, which can precipitate out and lead to um, calcifications potentially. And we're also going to see that, you know, do they produce a lot of active vitamin D? No, because they don't have that ability to have that second activation step in the kidneys. And so you'll see a lot of bone turnover and we'll see osteodystrophy that can occur here. So basically what happens for these patients with their uh, bone and mineral related disorders here, you'll start off by having decreased renal function for these patients here. That initially is going to lead to less phosphate being cleared through the kidneys. So you're going to build up phosphate levels of hyperphosphatemia. That extra phosphate then starts to bind up the calcium that's there in the bloodstream. Okay. So all that calcium being bound up now is not able to interact with the parathyroids. And then what does that cause to occur? I don't know if that was a proper sentence, but what happens after that? PTH release is going to go up, right? So parathyroid hormone is going to increase. And what does that do to, say, for instance, the bones? It's going to leach more calcium out of the bones. It's going to also try to get the kidneys to hold on to more calcium and phosphate, which is then more of that phosphate is going to cause a problem. And we'll also try to get more intake from the GI tract as well, right? The issue is wasn't their calcium in the first place, it was just the fact that their phosphate was too high. So you're going to see the phosphate binding is going to be another important um, modality we're going to go with here with these patients a little bit later on. Um, not only that, but low vitamin D levels because they can't have that 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. They don't form that in the kidneys. Uh, that will also increase PTH secretion as well. So you're going to see these things, again, tend to compound on one another um, as time goes on. So again, you get this progressive kidney disease. You're going to see here you have impaired phosphate uh, excretion. You're going to have phosphate retention. That leads to hypocalcemia. It's going to increase PTH release, and again, all of that just tends to cycle back around. They'll eventually are going to get even worse in um, kidney function. And you're just pulling all that calcium out of the bone. That's going to lead to things like osteomalacia, osteoporosis. So you can see how it's going to be kind of a problem here. So again, you get this parathyroid hyperplasia that occurs basically due to the fact that it's going to become more resistant to calcium and vitamin D. What's already there will become more resistant to it. And so you can get this osteitis fibrosis cystica, this basic high bone turnover disease, because the osteoclasts are just way too active and they're pulling out too much calcium here for those patients. Um, and then osteomalacia can, as a result of that, occur.
So uh, other things that can happen here due to uremic symptoms, so their VUN is going to be too high chronically, it can lead to things like CNS effects like fatigue, um, impaired concentration, confusion. Um, they also get kind of itchy when they're uremic, so you also see that's a kind of common thing they'll develop there, uh, and also the peripheral neuropathies. Not only that, but in terms of um, other signs you'll be looking at in terms of chronic kidney disease include things like changes in the urine output, maybe they're holding on to too much fluids and may become more edematous, you'll see that proteinuria in the urine, kind of has this foaming kind of urine that happens there, and then even abdominal is the ascension as they start to build up those fluid levels. So um, what are we going to do for these patients to get into actually how we're going to manage them? Ideally, we'd like to prevent any further progression of their kidney dysfunction uh, as much as we can. Can we do anything to reverse it? Not unless we give them brand new ones. So we're going to try to hold off on and keep as much function as we can for these patients and try to manage a lot of the complications that occur that we've kind of been talking about already. Ideally, we'd like to keep them from getting on hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis or transplant if we can, because what are the downsides of using dialysis? No. Infections can be a big thing that can happen there. Once they're on it, then they're typically dependent on it for a long time, uh, the rest of their life potentially. And so again, all the complications, making sure they're going every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, get their dialysis, or whatever they need to do, however they're doing it. So uh, if we can limit that need, that's always going to be a big deal. Um, and then try to address any kind of the primary issues for why they developed the kidney dysfunction in the first place. Was it due to diabetes? We'll get that under control, hypertension, et cetera. Oops. So anyway, so when talking about dialysis, again, just this is as deep as I'm going to get into it because, again, other people will teach you more about it than I will. Um, but basically, hemodialysis, it's uh, essentially you're going to be taking, uh, and usually for patients who are chronically on hemodialysis, they'll have a fistula that will be uh, placed in uh, the arm typically. And so you'll find that they'll take the blood out. It'll go to a dialyzer, which is a, kind of a filter. Uh, they'll be able to pull out all the extra stuff you want, extra fluid, electrolytes, et cetera. And then you put it back into the patient itself, right? This is typically about a four hour process, occurs about three times a week for most patients. Um, over here on the peritoneal side, this is kind of interesting because essentially what you're gonna do, and this can be like an at home kind of thing they can do potentially, is you'll allow for a dialysate solution to actually be infused into the peritoneal space. You'll let it sit there for a while, and you'll allow for this equilibration to occur where waste products will then equilibrate out into the peritoneal space. And essentially what it produces is urine, right? So without having the need for the kidneys, they'll then produce this urine, which you'll then take out, drain, and then you can do the same thing over again. Okay. Peritonitis is a big deal when you have these patients on this. So they that's a, I see a common cause for patients on PD to come into the ER is because they develop a peritonitis. And then sometimes we'll actually even give antibiotics in the dialysate solution just to infuse right here because if that's where the infection is, then that's going to get the best levels for those patients there. Um, so, anyway, so those are the main two modalities you're going to run into. Um, in the ICUs and stuff, you'll see a lot of like continuous renal replacement therapy where basically they're on the machine 24-7 um, to help clear stuff out. Um, frequently when I recommend dialysis for things like a lithium overdose or aspirin, it's typically for just a four-hour, one-time kind of deal. Typically, we don't need more than once, but that's, that's typically what I end up doing uh, for my, uh, my consults. So anyway... Look at some of the non-pharmacologic therapy for these patients here. Uh, diet's gonna be important. You wanna try to limit their protein intake uh, as best you can, especially as they get more progressive decreases in their GFR. Um, why do you wanna limit protein? How do you make your muscles move? What's the energy currency of your muscles? ATP, it's adenosine tri. Phosphate, there's a lot of phosphate in meats, right? So by getting, decreasing the protein intake, they're gonna decrease phosphate intake as well. Remember when we talked about trying to think. Actually, never mind. That's a different topic I was thinking of. Never mind. Um, but by limiting their protein intake, it's going to help with the phosphate um, uh, intake as well. We'll find some other ways we can help to treat that. But again, as you might imagine, these patients may have poor nutrition as a, re as a result of a lot of the GI effects we're seeing there. You also worry about them keeping on enough muscle mass, especially with elderly patients are going to be losing muscle mass anyway. So this can be sort of a double-edged sword for those patients there. We'll also try to limit sodium intake if we can, help out with the blood pressure concerns there. And obviously, if we can get them to stop smoking, that's great. If we can get them exercise, also an addition benefit. So in terms of diabetes and chronic kidney disease, because this is a very common comorbidity you're going to see here, um, this is why we like ACEs and ARBs so much is because we know that they're going to be nephroprotective. They're going to relieve some of that back pressure on the glomerulus and allow for decreased pressure so you have decreased wear and tear on the glomerulus over time. You have to be cautious though because again these patients with chronic kidney disease are at risk for hyperkalemia and guess what ACE inhibitors do? Well, ACE inhibitors decrease aldosterone release, and aldosterone, if you decrease the levels of that, what happens to your potassium levels? They go up, because remember, aldosterone likes to hold on to sodium as a result of losing potassium. If you recall how they work in the collecting duct, loses 
potassium to hold on to sodium. So if I decrease aldosterone release, if I were to get something like spironolactone, you hold on to that potassium, you lose that sodium. It's how it has this diuretic effect. So you want to watch, be watchful for that. Um, also consider as well, if they have a type 2 diabetes, they might be on metformin. As you start to get down to lower and lower creatinine clearances, especially less than 30, you want to take them off the metformin. Why was that? Lactic acidosis. It's a really important thing that I see a lot of people miss because these patients will be starting on metformin, they're on it for years, and then no one ever goes back and looks at their renal function to take them off of it potentially. Uh, especially if they have going a long time without follow up or if they're in the nursing home, things like that. So that's another common thing that I see missed quite frequently. So in terms of hypertension with patients with chronic kidney disease, again, we like to keep them usually at a target less than 140 over 90 or so. Um, hopefully if you can, uh, if they have like pretty significant albumin excretion and proteinuria, you can try to shoot for an even lower target than that. And for the most part, ACEs and ARBs should be first line for those patients, especially if they have diabetes. Uh, but if they can't tolerate that, you'll find that things like diuretics, like thiazides are not going to be um, usually effective by themselves, but you can use it maybe as a combination thing there. Typically, the hypertension will be managed though based on their other comorbid conditions. So for instance, if they have a history of MI, what should they be on? Beta blocker, what else? For hypertension management. For hypertension management. Should they be on ACE inhibitor as well? Mm -hmm. Remember, ACE inhibitors help to stop that left ventricular remodeling, right? They have CHF similar. They should be on a beta blocker and an ACE inhibitor. So again, you want to think about other things you can add on to help manage that based on their other comorbid conditions. So in terms of the anemia, what we can shoot for here is you want to make sure we're increasing the oxygen capacity. They can carry more oxygen to the tissues and try to decrease those signs and symptoms of anemia that may be developing there. Ideally, we also like to decrease need for transfusions, right? Because when it's costly, there's infusion reactions to worry about. It could be infectious disease risks that are low, but still present. Um, and so what we can do here is instead of giving a transfusion, we can give things like erythropoiesis stimulating agents or ESAs along with iron supplementation. And basically we just monitor this using their hemoglobin and we can kind of dose based off of that. So um, interesting thing about target hemoglobins in patients with chronic kidney disease that are getting ESAs, you know, what's like a typical, say like adult, you know, male or female hemoglobin, kind of a general range. Yeah, kind of in the mid-teens, right? So here, you actually don't want to shoot that high uh, for these patients here. Um, typically, we'll start an ESA on them when they're between, say, like 9 and 10 grams per deciliter, and they actually say discontinue it when they get, say, above 10, or maybe if they're above 11, if they have renal replacement therapy, because we know they're going to lose more hemoglobin just due to blood loss anyway. Um, the reason why we do that is because we see that if you start to shoot for normal, quote-unquote, levels for these patients with an ESA, they have like 13 grams per deciliter, there's a black box warning that you can increase risk for things like MI, stroke, and overall death. Why do you think that is? Increased viscosity of the blood. It starts to sludge up when you start to get that high of a hemoglobin concentration as a result of this ESA use, such that they're more prone to things like CVAs, MIs, etc. So that's a big black box warning. If you were to continue that patient on up, their risk is going to go as up as soon as the hemoglobin starts to get around those concentrations there. Um, and again, you'll find that even if you were giving these patients ESAs, you're trying to stimulate all that erythropoiesis, um, you're going to find that if the iron is not under control, it's not in check, then it's not going to do anything. You can still see the hemoglobin even drop further because it may still be losing some of that blood. So the two main ones you're going to run into include epoetin alpha, or epogen or procrit are common brand names there, and then darbipoetin alpha or aronesp is the other common one. These are injectable products. They are proteins because again, they're mimicking the effects of epoetin or erythropoietin. Um, and so they are also going to be pretty expensive for the most part. So again, um, you don't want to be using these if you don't have the iron in check because is iron pretty expensive? No. Iron's very inexpensive, right? Um, so at least do the easy thing first and then you will jump to these eventually if that's not being sufficient on its own. And so as I mentioned, the black box warnings there there are some cancer risks, but it's fairly low. Um, it's something you at least want to be cautious with. And then dosing of them can range, they can sometimes get them every, uh, every th uh, three times a week, make them every four weeks, it just depends on the agent there. Main adverse effects you wanna watch for, uh, obviously gonna be hypertension, just cause you're increasing that blood volume uh, and that vascular access thrombosis is also another thing. Now there's actually a concern if they have like an implanted port or if they have a fistula that's in there that could potentially clot off as a result of all the extra hemoglobin kind of sludging things up a little bit. Um, did I ever tell you about the guys, uh, tell you guys about the first patient I ever did blood pressure on when I was in school? I remember, so it was this um, 
it was uh, we were doing like a little like you know um, vital sign check kind of thing in, in like the first floor of our, our building where our school is located at, and so um, we you just had like you know you had patients kind of coming through day in and day out, and we had these little old patients that come in there and they let us check their blood pressure, and it was a very wonderful experience for us. We got to talk to people. It was like I was like a first year student, so it was like I didn't know anything from anything. So anyway, I at least knew I'd take a blood pressure, and so this little old lady, she was probably about nine thousand years old, and she comes <laughs> strolling in. And she sits down, I put the cuff on her and I pump it up and I'm listening. And all of a sudden I hear this I'm like, what does that sound? This does not sound like what I was told this would sound like. And she's like, oh yeah, that's my fistula. And I'm like, why are you letting me put all this pressure on that fistula? I thought I was gonna break something or kill her or something like that. I don't think she died. I think I saw her the next day or something. She was okay. But I was like, you should probably warn people about that sort of thing beforehand. So anyway, my first time doing a blood pressure on an actual patient, failure, total failure. But which is why I'm still in pharmacy and I don't actually do what you guys do. So there you go. Anyway, so looking at the iron status, um, again, this is gonna be required almost by every patient who's gonna be on the ESA and you need to make sure you're also keeping um, proper control of the other cofactors as well, things like B12 and folate, which can also sometimes be diminished with patients who are on that renal replacement therapy. You'll typically find that iron absorption is gonna be pretty poor for these patients, maybe only about 10% of what you would expect to be absorbed is going to. Um, so in those patients, oral intake by itself is not gonna be sufficient. What are some problems with oral intake of iron though? Constipation is a really big thing. So abdominal distension, GI upset, constipation is, is a big one. And so you want, also want to consider, okay, do they have other things that could be exacerbating that? So be, be cautious there. There's a lot of different oral iron preparations that are available. These are just three, but there are some more that are out there, but things like ferrous sulfate, ferrous gluconate, ferrous fumarate, they all have different salt contents in terms of the iron. So you always want to make sure you're dosing based off the elemental iron content. So as an example, if you look at a ferrous sulfate tablet, it's 325 milligrams of ferrous sulfate, but it's only 65 milligrams of elemental iron. When you're dosing, it makes sure you're doing it based off the elemental iron content. So that way you can switch between formulations and get an accurate dose of those patients there. Because it'll be pretty different between say like a ferrous fumarate versus a sulfate. So we also have some IV preparations that are available. This is for patients who are trying oral therapy, but it's just not really um, cutting the mustard, so to speak. They still can't get adequate levels. This is where you can come in for IV infusions of iron. Now iron usually once it's in the system, once it's bioavailable, which via IV it's 100%, it'll stick around for a while. So these are gonna be intermittent infusions they may be getting maybe every couple of months or so, depending on what their levels are doing. But we have examples like iron dextran, sodium ferric gluconate, iron sucrose, and uh, ferromoxidol. So as I mentioned, the constipation, the GI effects are really gonna be the big thing you're gonna see here. Anyone know what color the iron turns your feces? Black, is that a concern for patients? Why would it be a concern? Because we're about upper GI bleeds, right? Did I say these patients have bleeding risk? Mm -hmm. All right, so again, these are things you wanna warn the patient about. Let them know that, hey, could impart it kind of a black discoloration. It's not gonna be that same kind of tarry sort of um, consistency like melanoma would actually be, but it's something to at least be aware of. Um, with the IV formulations, though, you have kind of a different set of things to worry about. You have things like allergic reactions that can happen here. And if you infuse it too fast, you can even see things like hypotension, headaches and dizziness associated with it. You kind of get this vasodilatory sort of effect um, that can make patients feel pretty miserable. You gotta make sure they're not a fall risk, et cetera. So we slow down the infusion and it does help out with that pretty significantly. Afterwards, they can also develop some arthritis, some arthralgias as a result of the infusion as well. So different adverse effects depending on the dosage form, but it kind of makes sense that the oral iron causes a lot more GI side effects. So how do you select a uh, preparation? Typically use oral therapy if possible. Again, it's gonna be cheaper, fewer sort of systemic side effects to really worry about from that standpoint. Um, and we'll kind of just play around with it till we find the effective dosage or dosage form that works for that patient. You may just try switching around different salt forms to see what they like. Um, for patients who are on hemodialysis, most likely they're gonna need IV therapy. It's just what it comes down to, the oral, just not really gonna cut it. And so then you can monitor the iron status usually every three months or so while they're on the ESA therapy. You're gonna be monitoring their hemoglobin anyway to make sure that it doesn't get up too high um, and then kind of go from there. And again, these patients are coming into the dialysis center three times a week. So it's like, it's not like you're gonna uh, not run into them and be able to do labs when you need to. Um, so this is something that to kind of consider. So um, getting into the bone stuff, we can manage for these patients here, the bone and mineral disorders. Um, typically we want to try and sort of normalize as much as we can here. Um, it may not be completely possible depending on uh, how severe the renal dysfunction is. The ideal, we'd also like to keep the bones intact and try to prevent any sort of 
um, say cardiovascular or extravascular calcifications from occurring as a result of that high phosphate and calcium levels there. And then overall, if we can reduce morbidity and mortality, that's great. And then ultimately though, one of the things you should be shooting for is to try to make sure you're keeping a calcium phosphate product less than 55. So basically what that means is if you were to ca uh, multiply their calcium times their phosphate, if that number comes up higher than 55, then there are increased risk for having those calcifications occurring, right? Because if you're increasing concentrations of both, the solubility is going to eventually go where it's kind of oversaturated and it'll just bind up together and then that's it. This is also another big thing that we have to worry about from a pharmacy standpoint when we're mixing together electrolytes. We don't want to make sure we don't mix too much calcium and phosphate. This is a big thing we do when we do, um, you guys know what TPN is? total parental nutrition. We were doing a lot of our neonates over at Nemours. I think just you know, Monday when I was there, I think we had eight or, eight or 10 um, TPNs we did for our patients. And uh, I think maybe six or seven of them were in neonatal patients. And as you might imagine, uh, our neonates at pretty big risk for things like electrolyte disturbances and fluid imbalances and all. Yeah, of course. Um, and so that's one of the big things we watch for is make sure the calcium and phosphate levels are not too high in, in the actual solution to cause a precipitation to occur. But anyway, uh, in addition to that, we're also gonna watch their PTH levels and try to keep those at a somewhat normal level. Um, first thing you wanna do for them is try to make sure you're having, uh, try to have a dietary phosphate restriction that does include things like keeping the meat intake down to some degree. And we will sometimes shoot for around maybe 800 to 1000 milligrams per day for them, which again, makes protein supplementation pretty difficult for those patients. You wanna make sure you're giving enough to kind of keep them at baseline, but not so much they're gonna increase that phosphate intake. Interestingly, some other stuff that has high amounts of phosphate in it include things like colas and beer. I never knew beer was high in phosphate Tell them about this stuff, right? Uh, things like peanut butter and other nuts can also have pretty high phosphate levels. So you'd have like a list of foods you let them know, hey, probably avoid these if, if at all possible. Remember dialysis patients, because they are kind of chronically in the healthcare setting, they're chron chronically stressed by all of this, um, you will find they may have higher protein requirements. So against another balance, you'll have to keep there but between those. Um, Generally though, with phosphate hyperphosphatemia, dialysis is not good enough to pull it off. You may get some, but not enough to really kind of um, uh, sort of fix the baseline problem. And then you could always try a parathyroidectomy. That's typically for patients who are not responding well to other pharmacologic therapies. So if they kind of failed everything else, then you can just go ahead and just cut them out altogether. Yes, ma'am. Um, you can survive without them. People have parathyroidectomies. Um, you may have to supplement um, different things and probably monitor them a little bit more closely, but yeah, we do it occasionally. It's just not, it's not a common thing I would do here. I'm just trying to list like different things that could be done from a non-pharmacologic standpoint. Unless you're a surgeon, they say cut everything out, right? Anyway, um, so getting into the, the medications we can use here, phosphate binders are gonna be um, uh, kind of mainstay of therapy for a lot of these patients. Um, basically, they'll bind up phosphate in the GI tract and prevent them from being absorbed in the first place. Basically, it'll become insoluble just like it would if it was in the, in the systemic side of things, but you can do it out in the GI tract. Um, this is nice because we have a very easy one that we can administer to these patients, calcium carbonate. It's easy enough, right? You can get Tums fairly cheaply. Um, what can calcium carbonate also cause from a GI tract standpoint though? Constipation, right? Now I'm starting to see we have multiple medications here. Also, if you're giving oral iron supplementation, does that bind to calcium? Mm -hmm. All right, so now you have to think about what we're timing these medications to make sure we're avoiding any of these drug interactions here. So another one could be a calcium acetate or Foslo. It could be an, uh, that's a prescription-based product. So if they maybe cannot tolerate Tums for whatever reason, you can potentially try something like calcium acetate. If they're hypercalcemic, maybe you don't want to give them any more calcium. And in which case we could try other things like Savalimer carbonate, lanthanum carbonate, or aluminum hydroxide. All three of those um, are going to be prescription-based products and they all have some, some limitations to them as we'll see here in just a moment. So as I mentioned, um, these calcium-based products are typically nice uh, to be used kind of early on in chronic kidney disease. Um, a lot of times these patients tend to be hypocalcemic, mainly because their high phosphate levels are binding up all that calcium. So again, early on, maybe calcium carbonate is a good one to start with. Later on, when they're hypercalcemic as well due to diminished function, you may want to switch over to something uh, alternative to that. And so um, here it's important to make sure that you're gonna be giving um, calcium carbonate in more acidic medium. So again, when you're, when's your stomach kind of releasing the most acid? around mealtime, when you're taking most of your protein in, 
around mealtime. So it kind of makes sense you kind of use these all at the same time that are trying to bind up some of that extra phosphate. Um, other ones we can use potentially include things like Savalomer, which is basically this kind of non-adsorbable hydrogel that just kind of sits there in the GI tract and will bind up some of that phosphate. Um, can have some nice effects on the lipids. It's a minor effect, but may be beneficial for them. And then the aluminum we don't really like so much anymore. Aluminum itself uh, is, is actually neurotoxic. And what would happen for these patients, they would not be able to clear the aluminum from the kidneys and they would kind of build up levels over time. So that one's not, uh, not ideal, but it could be an alternative if need be. So uh, as I mentioned, generally you're gonna find constipation, uh, nausea, vomiting are gonna be common here. Diarrhea, you might see more with the aluminum hydroxide because we've kind of talked about that before when we talk about antacids, that can be a common thing there. And then I see hypercalcemia as a concern if you're using a calcium-based product, right? You wouldn't see that with like Savellum or Lanthanum. Um, and then from an aluminum standpoint, again, this is gonna be usually held off mainly because we're worried about that CNS toxicity that can occur over time. Um, also, you can have a worsening anemia because the, the aluminum can actually, uh, be absorbed preferentially to the iron and that can be an issue causing uh, even worse anemia for those patients there. But the big thing to note is gonna be the drug food and the drug drug interactions here, right? Because again, these patients are chronically coming in, getting their dialysis. Are they at risk for infection? 100%, right? So then you have to think, start thinking about what if I put them on, say they get an ammonia or something and I put them on a fluoroquinolone. Well, they take that at the same time as their calcium or their iron, things like that, they're gonna bind up and not be as effective. So consider how they're gonna be spacing these things out to make sure they're not gonna bind one another up, right? So either, Take whatever agent, like say a fluoroquinolone, an hour before you consume like a calcium-containing product or say three hours afterwards. You separate them out enough to allow for no interaction between the two. So in terms of vitamin D therapy, remember these patients are not gonna be able to complete that secondary um, activation step. So the first one happens where? In the liver, second in the kidneys. So even if they get all the sun in the world, they're still not going to be able to activate any of that vitamin D there. And so what we'll go ahead and do is give them calcitriol, which is already the activated form. It's that 125 dihydroxy formulation there. And it's prescription only. It's more expensive than giving just straight ergo or cholecalciferol. But again, these patients, that's going to be useless to them anyway. And so by giving the vitamin D, this is basically going to help us to suppress that PTH secretion. Because again, the parathyroids are going to think, hey, there's enough vitamin D here. We don't have to release as much. Also will help to stimulate calcium absorption from the GI tract, which is good in that early state where the calcium may be low for those patients there. Um, only downside to it though, is if the patients are hypercalcemic, well, that's also gonna worsen that. And then also if they're hyperphosphatemic, it actually stimulates renal reabsorption of phosphate. So that can be a problem there. So you do wanna watch those levels and kind of see where they're going. Um, occasionally what we can give instead of calcitriol is actually something called paracalcitol. And this actually is a sensitizer, actually helped to activate the PTH receptors, but it doesn't have the same effects that vitamin D does down in the kidneys. And so it doesn't increase reabsorption. It doesn't increase absorption from the GI tract either. So it could be an alternative. Someone had, it was hypercalcemic, hyperphosphatemic. Calcitriol may not be good. Instead, you can use something like paracalcitol as an alternative. So another one we have here is gonna be Sinicalcid or Sensipar. This is another sensitizer of the PTH uh, or of uh, parathyroids such that it allows um, for calcium essentially to be more effective at those receptors. So what calcium is there, it's more likely to bind and, and tell the parathyroids, hey, we have enough here. We don't need to release any more PTH in those cases there. So that helps to reduce down those PTH concentrations, especially if there's someone who had high levels and was starting to sap a lot of calcium from the bone there. So. Any questions on that? It's kind of the main things you're gonna be looking at with this chronic kidney disease patients in addition to all the other conditions they have. Um, these patients get uh, pretty sick when they do, especially uh, if they miss a couple rounds of dialysis and they come into the ER and their potassium, oh, what's a normal potassium? Say three and a half to five, depending on the lab you're looking at. Three and a half to five is, is pretty common. These patients will come in like seven, eight, right? And you have to manage that. We'll talk about hyperkalemia when we get into the um, ER section uh, later on. We'll talk about that. And also when these patients get infected, it's also very bad as well because now you have to think about, okay, well, um, you know, these patients have, you know, if a patient with dialysis, on dialysis, gets a pneumonia, what do you automatically characterize it as? Is it a community acquired pneumonia? No, it's the HCAP already because, again, they're always going into the dialysis center. Again, there could be more resistant bugs there. So immediately you're thinking, okay, I have HCAP as a patient who's pretty sick. What do you want to start them on? What are you concerned with them having? Are you worried about MRSA? Mm -hmm. Are you worried about things like Pseudomonas? Possibly, yeah. So then all of a sudden you're thinking, okay, well, I'm going to put them on Bancomycin, Gentamicin, and, and Piperacillin, and Tazobactam. Well, guess what? All three of those require renal dose adjustments, right? So now all of a sudden you're looking at, okay, well, how frequently do I give these? What doses am I giving? Something like vancomycin, I may only give, um, say, every 48 hours potentially because their body just can't clear as much or as well. Um, 
sometimes we'll just give a one-time dose of vancomycin and we'll just do like random levels every day until they get down to a, a, an efficient sufficient trough and they'll redose it right so sometimes we're actually doing just random dosing because they are so um, labile in, in terms of their kidney function so it can be quite difficult um, however I've seen patients that are on dialysis that have been the sickest I've ever seen and somehow they still recover so I kind of liken dialysis patients to like cockroaches like when the bombs drop they'll be alive along with the cockroaches that's it like you just can't kill these dialysis patients in a lot of cases so um, hardy people I will say um, anyway so any questions on that so far okay so I have the fear of running out of material before I get to the uh, the review I'm actually gonna check the board and then I will release you for the day yes. what could he be real oh my goodness you guys are really excited there's no questions here so do you all have any questions at all? If not, I will bid you adieu.